Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. MashaAllah, so, so wonderful to be back here, alhamdulillah, in this um, place of beloveds with Ahlul Bayt. <laughs> and alhamdulillah, uh, alhamdulillah, Sidi Uthman, mashaAllah, who I fell in love with on my last trip, mashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, love still strong, alhamdulillah, so nice to meet. And obviously, our brother Barakah Blue, mashaAllah. Uh, it's been many years. How, how many years since you were last in Jordan? About a decade. It's been a decade. So we lived right across from each other. My my door was here, and his door was here, and we were both at uh, at Qasid. I was I was working at Qasid. He came to study, mashallah. Very studious, studious, studious student, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah. Admirable. Just sitting in the cubicle every day by himself, just reviewing. Mashallah. You haven't changed. You haven't aged. Mashallah. You're looking better and better. So I just I my, my only you know. The only regret in time is when you, when you don't get to do as many good things, that's when you regret looking back. Mm -hmm. And that's knowing funny. that you were right across my door, and we didn't get to know each other as well, at least Allah has brought us back together now another time in the dunya. So hopefully, inshallah, we'll catch up. <laughs> inshallah. So, you know, alhamdulillah, one of the things about tonight, um, we won't talk long about the story of the Isra and the Mi'raj, because that's tomorrow at the SBIA. Uh, inshallah for anyone who'd like to come where we recount the entire story but what this is is to remember is that the Isra and the Mi'raj even if we don't know all the details it, it's a love story it really is a story of love I'll tell you one of the times that I felt uh, I felt that love I realized that this love of the Prophet وسلم, is what has been powering the Ummah the Muslim civilization is powered on love for the Prophet ﷺ. And you know when I felt that most clearly? I didn't feel that uh, most clearly in the poetry, even though, you know, we love the poetry. I didn't find it, uh, I didn't find it in those things of higher culture. Sometimes you find it in, in the heart of a person. And you realize the effect that it's been having on this ummah for all these, these centuries, subhanAllah. I remember once, I uh, sh shared this story only maybe once or twice before, but where it really opened my eyes was I was walking um, in New Delhi, actually Old Delhi, and I had just started, this was about 10 to 12 years ago, I had just started to reconnect with my, with my parents, my, my heritage. And so I'm walking in Old Delhi, which is the Muslim part near the Jame, Old Jami Mosque. I don't know if any, anyone's been there and seen that. Uh, very historic, you know, tr ancient area, o uh, hundreds of years old. And around it is this, like, bustling marketplace. And, you know, things are very run down. They don't, they, you know, the, the, the Muslim situation there is not like it used to be in the past. And, you know, due to a lot of different things. And there's a cacophony of noises. You know, you're hearing, like, chickens. You're, you're, you know, you're hearing uh, rickshaws honking and cars and people yelling and hawk hawking items. And there's all these, there are all these smells in the air. There's the dust. There's like the biryani that's cooking here, and there's some other bad smells, and all kinds of things are happening around you in your senses. And as I was walking through that with my backpack, and just you know, I just hear, you know, back in the in the days in those countries, you have like these shops that sell musical cassettes, and they're blaring like stuff from their shop to get you to come inside, and they've got all these different cassettes and CDs and everything. And as I was passing by, um, I'm hearing a qawali, right? I wasn't too familiar with qawali at that time. I wasn't too open to it as well, but that's a different story. But the thing is, I was walking by, and so I hear this playing, and I'm not familiar with them, right? Um, but because my parents speak Hindi, so I understood some of their language. It's very close to Urdu. So I, I turned around with, in, with the noise, and I look around, and there is a... Uh, a poor man with Down syndrome, sitting in the dust, literally on the street in India, which is just all these cars coming around. And he was sitting with a card, in, almost inside a cardboard box. And the flap of it was up, and he was taking the flap of it and pumping it back and forth like a harmonium. And he was absolutely lost in the words of that Qawali. And the, the and for some reason, I just zeroed in on the words. And I didn't even find it until many years later, but it stayed in my heart. And it was the koala, the koala was saying, and I'm not a koala singer, 
But he was saying, uh, and you'll see why this is relevant. He said, he was, it's very simple Qawali, and he was saying that the night of the ascension of the Prophet ﷺ is a Mubarak night. And sometimes I just start remembering my Prophet. Sometimes I keep remembering him and remembering him. And it was just that refrain over and over again. It's really not a very complicated uh, Qawali. And, and I, when I saw when I saw, heard the words recounting the Isra and the Miraj, but just this idea of the memory of Rasulullah so, so deep, that love so deep, and you're seeing this, the words of the Qawwal, which are reflecting the love of the Prophet in the Ummah through art, but being refracted through a pure soul. This man with Down syndrome, he's completely involved in it, just engrossed in it. It's like the entire world does not matter to him. There's so much going on, anyone can just hit you, step over you, and he's just in another world. And that I felt like, like a, like a prism, you know, of light just went right, and I felt that. And, I, and I, that was such a time-stopping experience for me. And that's at that point I realized that yes, we can read the poetry, study the books, but the love of the Prophet ﷺ resides in the hearts of his ummah. And if you want to know all the words is only an expression, but the best way to connect to it is to connect to the lovers of the Prophet Sallallahu and, and I felt at that point, not his love for the Prophet, I felt the Prophet's love for him and the Prophet's love for all of us. Because what's coming through that pure soul? It's just like energy, right? It's just like something coming through. So he's just a conduit. And in fact, we're all conduits. We're all just like wires of the Prophet Sallallahu love coming from since, you know, pre-eternity, you know, when, when Allah willed him, you know, in Allah's knowledge, you know, obviously the Prophet was creation. But the point is that that's a mercy from Allah, and when did Allah will that in pre-eternity, right? Because Allah, he's uh, subhanAllah, the most beloved of Allah. And so in this, in the Isra and the Mi'raj, in the Isra and the Mi'raj, it's a love story. And we, we won't go through all of it, but in reality, when you look at the who was the Isra and the Mi'raj for? We often think it was for the Prophet, but from the Prophet's perspective, when you think about it, it's actually for us. The whole Isra and the Mi'raj is a love story, and it's for us, even though he's the one who suffered so much. He's the one who suffered so much, then, and then Allah elevated him. Allah, you know, not just, he was always, already elevated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but here's the difference. Whereas Musa alayhi salam, he had an appointment with Allah and he had to go up to a mountain and to try to reach Allah. He was seeking Allah. It was different because Angel Jibreel came and Allah was seeking the Prophet Allah called the Prophet up. Allah called the Prophet up. He didn't have to go and search. And this is why from the beginning, we know that this was showing the, the high rank of the Prophet the lofty status and it wasn't because Allah was, you know, it, it wasn't because the Prophet needed it. It's to show it to the rest of the world. Because the world was already graced by Rasulullah And yet, the people of the world were not fulfilling their haq to the Prophet He was being opposed and bitterly persecuted. And so yet, there was, there was one group of beings that had not experienced Rasulullah, even though they knew about him. And that was the people of the heavens. The beings of the heavens... And so, I just imagine the treat that they got to finally lay their eyes on Rasulullah right? And that's why as soon as he goes, he, he, he comes from Angel Jibreel, with Angel Jibreel on Burak and goes to Masjid Al-Aqsa. When he's at Masjid Al-Aqsa, it's, it's just something that's understood all the prophets fell behind him to pray. You know, when you, when you, when you're, when you, uh, it's time for prayer and people are equals, everyone's saying, no, you go, no, you please, no, you pray. And everyone's getting... No, for the, for when the Prophet was among them, it was just natural that he would be the one to take the lead. And this is this is prophets who have more knowledge than everyone else. They understand the leadership of Rasulullah. But sometimes do we allow him to take the lead in our lives? And then when he when he finishes the prayer, and just a few reflections, Angel Jibreel salam, brings a tray, and there is one glass or a vessel of milk 
and one vessel of wine. In another narration, there were three with honey as well. And the Prophet ﷺ, immediately he reaches for the milk and he drinks it and he leaves the wine right there. And Jibreel ﷺ, sees that and tells him, uh, he said, Asabt. He said, Asabt al fitra He says, you have chosen correctly and chosen the natural state, the fitra. Because milk is something that is, it's uninterfered with. It's not, it's not meddled with. And this is the fitra. When you have a heart that's not interfered with and corrupted. Whereas wine, even though it wasn't haram in that time, it was long before wine was made haram. The Prophet ﷺ himself avoided it because of his fitra. And then what did Jibreel Jibri say? And this is what's the most amazing. Is he said, had you chosen the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. And so as, our, as uh, my teacher taught me, he said, this is proof that an action of the Prophet ﷺ determined the fate of the ummah. One sip of the Prophet ﷺ could have determined whether we were in Iman or not. Our believing in Allah was not about everything that we've done and what, we, what school we went to and what book we read. It was one sip of Rasulullah and khalas. We were, we were guided to the end of time as an ummah. Allahu Akbar. This is, the, this is the, the, the being that we are speaking about when we think about Rasulullah. So if that's even from his, his one sip could naturally go towards what would benefit his ummah, just imagine the rest of what he did for us. And when the Prophet ﷺ, he went through all of the, the, the seven heavens and all of the beautiful things that we'll discuss tomorrow about all those things, we don't even realize how intimately connected we are to Rasulullah ﷺ. Because our sitting here was dependent on, as I said, that sip that happened before the Mi'raj. So what we don't even realize is we can go become heedless, but we are intimately connected to him. Just like, just like a baby like that's running around, oblivious. But there's someone watching over that baby who cares for that baby. And this baby's like, yeah, I don't know, whatever. And there's a hardworking mother behind that child. There's a hardworking father who's always looking out and making sure, they can run around a little bit, but making sure they don't get hurt, making sure they're fed, making sure they're safe and protected, getting everything they need. And as, as an ummah, many times we go through life not realizing how much of the blessings and love of Rasulullah is actually all over us, protecting us. His du'as from where he is now are coming towards us according to the, to, according to the hadith of the Prophet so this is even as he goes behind, beyond the seven heavens and beyond the Siddhartha Muntaha into the Divine Presence and whatever it was that was there. We don't even know the words. We don't even know the words that occurred in that blessed meeting between Allah and His beloved Rasul it was, it, was it was between master and servant. But one thing we do know is that there was, there was talk about us as an Ummah there. That even in that maqam, in that place, he has concern for us. And this is the amazing thing. Like, just imagine if you were in a place after persecution, after being tortured, after being denied, after being losing your loved ones, and being stoned, and finally you're in bliss, paradise. And even there, when after all the troubles could be solved and no other hardship ever, even there you're remembering us the Ummah of the Prophet He's still remembering us. And when he gets those prayers, he accepts it completely. But when he passes by Musa salam, on his way back, right, Musa salam, advises him and he says, you know, go back. He's like, I, I have experience with human beings. Go back. That's exactly what he said. He said, he said, uh, he said, he said, I've, I've, I have experience with people. And he gives the Prophet salam, loving brotherly advice from one prophet to another, an older prophet to another, to another prophet. And you know, it was when the Prophet ﷺ left from meeting him, Musa ﷺ was crying. So that it was asked, why are you crying, Musa? Like, why do you cry in Jannah? Why would you cry in Jannah? He said, because, because this young man who came after me, more people will enter Jannah from his ummah than my ummah. So even just the he didn't think about it. like it, that didn't occur until he saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he realized how lucky his ummah is. How lucky his ummah is. That it made other prophets cry. 
because they they wished that they could be the prophet of this ummah and because Allah said no you can't then they said oh Allah at least make me part of the ummah but rather the Rasul is a shaheed on our ummah and on all the ummah and on all the prophets just think about that where our Rasul Sallallahu is and how lucky we are and then when he when he got that advice the Prophet Sallallahu does go back and he goes back why? because if Allah gives you a commandment right you would take it you wouldn't say anything but he goes back because he knows it's in our interest so that's why he goes back usually when someone a, le- a king tells you something go do this would you dare enter back and say look I want I want you to revise what you've told me but this as the ulama say that one of the wisdoms of, the, of going back and forth and we know he goes back the prayers are 50 then goes to 40 then goes to 30 in some narrations it goes by 50 to 45 to 40 but it goes all the way down to 5 and they say that the wisdom of that, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, is to prepare our Rasul Sallallahu for the shafa, yeah. for his intercession. When he will go to Allah on the Day of Judgment and ask Allah, Oh Allah, take some of the people out of the hellfire, my ummah, ummati, ummati. Oh, yeah. And Allah will say, go take these people out, and so he'll take them back. Then he'll go back and go back and go back and forth. Because, it's, it's subhanAllah, because if he, as some of the ulama say, if it was the first time when he went to meet Allah on the Day of Judgment, that would be very, very scary. It would be, it would be awe, it would be majesty. And so here he experienced that on his own, going back and forth, back and forth. Because on the Day of Judgment, that haiba, that awe will not overtake him. But rather it will be uns, it will be, it will be intimate familiarity. Because when you see somebody very big and prominent and majestic in the beginning, you're always a little taken aback by them. You're a bit scared by them. But when you get to know them, you start to become familiar with them. And it's a love that develops. Even with the Prophet that's what they used to say. As they said in, 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 in Arabic, they said, The one, whoever used to come up to the Prophet suddenly, they would, they would get a little awe and awestruck. But once they got to sit with him, got to know him a little bit, then they would start to love him. And um, I put that into a poetic phrase. And um, it goes like this. If you saw him suddenly, one look would take your breath away. But if you sat with him, his character would steal your heart away. So the thing is, when this is the same thing with, with Allah. When he goes back and forth, it's because of that. Now, when you think about this as well, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him two honors on that night. That Allah let him hear his speech directly. Only Musa alayhi had heard Allah directly before that. But the added thing was, and this is a debate within the Ahlul Sunnah, but there is that position of the many, most of our scholars, of that the Prophet ﷺ also saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. Allah, he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. And this is what will come back to benefit the ummah yeah, during the shafa as well, alhamdulillah. So this is where, when he came back, this is now, now think about this, this is what um, the great poet Muhammad Iqbal, alayhi, what he said in his, he philosophized, uh, as it's written, that this is the difference between a prophet and a wali, a saint. When a saint does everything for Allah and he goes to the hereafter in Jannah, that's it. He doesn't want to come back. Because he's with Allah now. He's with his Lord. Why would you, why the one beloved that you want to be with, you would stay forever. Your problems are over. A prophet comes back. And that's what makes the prophet different from a wali. Any one of us, if we could just go and take see a second of paradise, or be with Allah, moreover, we would never want to come back, never come back to this dunya with all the family and all the money and all the everything that we have. All the beloveds, we would never want to come back. And yet it's the Prophet Wasallam that says, no, I will come back. And he, what does he come back to? Does he come back to a life that is so much more comfortable? No. No. He, he came from hardship and persecution, went to Allah, and then came back to more hardship and persecution. He came back to lose his children in front of his eyes. He came back to be struck at Uhud, he came back for the fear, with the, in the fear of Badr. 
at the existential threat of the trench. He came back for, to, to experience the poisoning at Khaybar that stayed with him for the rest of his life until he passed away. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why? For our sake. That's why the Isra and the Miraj is ultimately a love story. And it's, the, it's about the fact that before the victory of the world comes the spiritual victory. And we were, in one sense, in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ and there with him. And it was done for our sake. And the only thing that now is upon us, the only thing that is upon us now is we have the example of the, the greatest Siddiq, Abu Bakr anhu. Sidna Abu Bakr, what did he say? He, they, he was just asked, do you believe about what your companion Muhammad Wasallam says, that he went overnight to Jerusalem and came back, when it takes us 30 days going and 30 days coming, the Quraysh challenged. And what did Abu Bakr say? He said, if he said it, then I believe it. Because I believe something that is, that is greater than this. I believe he's getting revelation from through the seven heavens, directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that tasdiq is why he got that name, as-siddiq. It's why he is the best person. He is the best person. After all the prophets, he's the best of human beings. Not because of, not because as the ulama say, not because of the amount of prayers and fasting he did, but, but something had, that had settled inside his heart. So when we realize what the Isra and the Mi'raj was from Rasulullah for us, then our only response is to be like Abu Bakr and say that we, we bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. And that we will act like that and live like that for the rest of our lives. Sayyidina Muhammad Ali I'll just figure it, I'll just finish, inshallah, um, by reading something from I'll just sing one chapter of the Sira song, inshallah. Um, you guys might know this from before. And I've actually started to um, to translate the chorus into English as well. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, yeah, this this Sidi Tariq Basili kinda got me to do it. Like this. So so you know how it begins. La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. La ilaha illallah, there is no God except Allah. Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad is his messenger. Alayhi salatullah, peace be on him from Allah. After losing wife and uncle and the boycott of his clan, after Ta'if where they stoned him came a gift from Ar-Rahman. As he lay asleep beside the noble Kaaba in the night, he was woken by the angel and then taken up in flight. Riding on Burak he made the journey that is called Isra to the city of Jerusalem, to Masjid al-Aqsa. There he led the prophets in a prayer and chose milk over wine, then ascended to the heavens for a tryst with the divine. Raised beyond the seven skies, so many wondrous sights he saw, till he crossed the furthest low tree for his discourse with Allah. Sent back on that very night, he bought a gift for his ummah. On the next day, Muslims stood with him to pray their first salah. La ilaha illallah, 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 Muhammad Rasulullah, alayhi salatullah. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi wa ala alihi.